Well, the, the importance of knowing God. Uh, as we continue our, our study uh, on the foundations of Christianity, as we, and, uh, and of course, uh, you, you may or may not be able to see the power. Yes, it's up. Okay, good. It's, uh, the, t the sermon series is entitled, Christianity Not for Dummies. And of course, I use that, that little uh, for dummies uh, format in there just to give us the idea that what we're doing is we're returning to the foundational things of Christianity. We're returning to the foundational truths of Christianity. Well, consider the following statement by Dr. Norman Geisler about God. The most important thing about us is what we think of God. We can't be like God unless we know what God is like. We can't know the true God unless we know the truth about God. We cannot recognize false gods unless we know the true God. Idols are idols, whether they're mental or whether they're metal. We tend to become like the object we worship. An ultimate commitment to anything less than ultimate will not ultimately satisfy. <clears throat> What's God like? What comes to mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. Our perception of God. Is our perception of God a, a biblical per perception of God? Is our perception of God a, a, an accurate, a correct, a, a, a laser accurate perception of, of who God is? It's essential for success in an area of any area of life. A small view of God is going to limit our ability to work in our for Him to work in our lives. And an inaccurate view of God is little more than idolatry. If you remember last week, we talked about that there are four sources of authority that we hang our hat on, that we depend on as we assess things, as we, as we make decisions, as we assess the, the circumstances of our, of our life. The first, the first source of authority that we remember and that we use is our own intellect. And intellect is how we reason through things, how we view things based on what we think and based on what we know. And perhaps you've heard people say as they're having discussions, well, that just really doesn't make any sense to me. That, uh, in, in my mind, uh, I, I, just, I think it's this. And perhaps you remember that uh, way back in the time of the judges, we read a repeated statement that says there was no king in Israel... Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that paints a picture of postmodernism, friends. That paints a picture of this postmodern idea that what is true for you is fine. That's fine for you. But what's true for me is equally as fine. And so, you know, we can agree to disagree. And you can be right and I can be right as well. The second source of authority is our experiences. Our experiences in life give us this, uh, when, we, when we go through things, when we come out to the other side of things and we look back on our experiences, we say, well, you know, that's just kind of how I view the world. Or you say, well, that really is something that I've never seen before, so it just really, I don't agree with it because I've just never seen it. The third source of authority, I kind of joke around because, you know, we're Baptists and we don't struggle with, is tradition. Tradition is another source of authority. And perhaps you've heard people say, well, you know, we've always done things that way. And as long as those traditions align with biblical truth, that's fine. You know, we have the Lord's Supper. We're going to celebrate that this morning. We're going to celebrate a tradition, a biblical tradition of the Lord's Supper. Several weeks ago, we celebrated another tradition of baptism. Those traditions are biblically based. But if we have traditions that we adhere to that are not aligned with biblical truth, we err. The fourth source of authority is, of course, the Bible. And it's the only true source of authority. It's the only measuring rod, the only reed, the only canon. That word canon means measuring rod or stick or reed. It's the only correct measuring rod for truth. In and of itself, the Bible is the only true source of authority. And so as we look at God, we must look at God from the perspective of the Bible. We must study the Word of God and understand what the Bible says about God. And if there's a perception that is out of alignment with the Bible about God, 
then it's inaccurate. And according to A.W. Tozer, it's idolatry. Just to give us our context, of course, this is Foundations of the Faith. It's a study of the rudiments of Christianity. We began last week with the Bible. This week we're looking at what is God like? What is God like? And just to remind us, you know, perhaps there have been people that have been Christians in here for most of their lives. You say, well, Pastor Doug, I've been a Christian for, for 30, 40, 50. I've been a Christian for 60 years, Pastor Doug. You're, you're going back to all these foundational things. And what it reminded us of last week was one of the greatest football coaches in the history of the game, Vince Lombardi, would begin every season with the statement, this is a football. Perhaps you were watching TV last night and you, you watched the Houston Astros uh, win uh, the game, uh, allowing them to move on to, to the World Series. That's a very exciting time. But just remember that last February, every one of those folks that are now moving on to the World Series showed up for spring training. They make millions of dollars a year, but there they are, shagging pop flies, fielding grounders, doing batting practice, watching videos, looking at the rudiments. Professionals review the basics at least once a year. And so let us remember that we will return to the basics in very much the same way as all these other professionals in, or in, short, in order to ensure that we are doing the rudiments the right way. So what is God like? What is God like? Well, God is, and I have a review sheet just uh, so that there's a visual. And by the way, uh, last week when I preached for that 59-minute sermon, and I, I promise you not to do that today, as I, as I preached that 59-minute that sermon, I had some folks saying, I was trying to take notes. I was trying to, trying to keep up with you, and finally I just threw my pencil away. And so what I did was I, I went ahead and, and printed the outline from last week. They're back there on the back table, and this week's outline also is going to be on the back table for you. And every week, I will bring an outline for you so that you have that in front of you. So what is God like? What does the Bible say that God's like? Well, the Bible says that God is living. And we read about that in John chapter 5 and verse 26. We also read about that in Joshua chapter 3 verse 10. We read about that in Psalm 84, 2 and Daniel 6, 27. Talks about the living God, the living and active God. God is not a God who stepped into creation, created all of what we see here, all the tangible physical realm, and then just set, set the world a spinning and stepped away. He's a living God. He is an active God. He's active and participating in creation. He is a personal God. You know, as big as he is, as, as massive as God is, as unlimited as God is, he is a personal God. And he knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, Psalm 34, 18, and John chapter 1, verse 14. He is spirit. God is spirit. You know, and as we read in the text, sometimes we read about the face of God or the hand of God. And we need to remember, as we're studying the text, that there is figurative language. The Hebrew language particularly is peppered with figurative language. And so when we, so when we read in the text in John chapter 4 and Acts chapter 7 and 2 Corinthians chapter 3 about God being spirit, God does not have a form. Now, he has appeared to to folks from time to time as a theophany, as a way for people to be able to see something and communicate and interact with something. And we read in the Old Testament sometimes about the angel of the Lord. Sometimes we read an angel of the Lord, and that's an actual angel. But when we read the angel of the Lord, friends, that is the pre-incarnate Christ, the theophany appearing to humanity in a way that, that humans could identify. But God is spirit. God is spirit. And so he is not able, he's not able to be seen. The text tells us in 1 John, no one has ever seen God at any time. He is triune. What do I mean by that? We, heard, we read that word trinity and we say, well, I don't really see that in the text. But the triune God is identified as God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. All one, one being, one being with three persons, three distinct offices, offices that, that play particular roles in the interaction with humanity, yes, but in all of creation and in all of eternity, 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit have roles that they play. God is a triune God. We read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, in James chapter 2, in John chapter 6 and 20, and John 1, 1, and in Acts chapter 5, and John 14, and Matthew 28, and Genesis 1, and Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 16, we read about God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. God is a triune God. The Bible clearly states, though, that He is only one God. It's, it's, he's not a, a polytheism. It is, is not in play here. He, there's one God, three persons. I've heard people try to explain the Trinity. I've heard people try to describe it. Most of the time, most of these comparisons, you know, with uh, you know, the sunlight or the water and, and those sort of things are all what we call modalism. And, of course, that is heresy. So there's really no clear way, and by the way, y'all probably know that, that I, I teach a class over at College of Biblical Studies on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, and I want you to understand that there's really no clear way to describe the indescribable, unlimited God in this way. It's incomprehensible. Nevertheless, the text shares this information with us, and so we believe it to be true. That there are three different persons identified the Father is called God. The Son is called God. The Spirit is called God. They are all God. Remember this, friends, that as we, as we talk about Jesus Christ, from time to time, if we're being honest with ourselves, and maybe not at this time in, in our walk with, with the Lord, but at, at some points in our walk, we thought of Jesus as this minion, as this creation that, that God made, and he put a special spirit in him and so forth, and he had all of these things that he did, and then, and then he died and rose again and so forth. Make no mistake, friends. Jesus Christ is God. He is God. He is the all-powerful creator of all things, and we read about him as the creator in John chapter 1 talks about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, and you drop down in chap chapter, chapter uh, 1, verse 14, and, and it says, and the Word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is not a creation, friends. Jesus Christ is God, and He is actually the Creator, according to the Bible. Well, let's talk about the greatness of God. God is a great God. I don't know, maybe you prayed that little prayer when you were a kid. You know, God is great. God is good. It's true. <laughs> God is awesome. He's amazing. He, we serve an amazing God. And friends, I just, I don't, I don't think we, we allow the magnitude of how amazing and how great God is to, to wash over us. Because if we did, man, we would just be doing what we do when our team wins the championship. When our football team wins, wins the championship. When our baseball team wins the championship. Or when we're at the bowling alley and we get a strike. I think we get more excited there than we do at church. Friends, God is awesome. He deserves all the glory, all the honor, all the praise belongs to Him. And He is an amazing God. We serve an amazing God. And He is infinite. He is infinite. He has no limits. The reason, another quality of his is that he is immutable. He is immutable, which means he never changes. Let that wash over you. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. These are all interactive things, and I want to talk over these. But he, he is infinite, and the reason why he is immutable is because all of his qualities are are unlimited, and so they all exist in a perfect balance of infinites. God is infinite. He is eternal. He had no beginning. He has no end. He had no beginning. He has no end. And try to wrap your mind. I know that we can maybe wrap our mind around eternality in the future because you and I will spend eternity with the Lord. We are created beings, but we will have no end. We will go on and on and on for all eternity with the Lord as believers. Hallelujah for what he did so that we could do that. But try to wrap your mind around eternity past. No beginning. No beginning. We have trouble wrapping our mind around that, friends. But let this wash over you for just a moment. Think about it this way. God created 
beginnings. He created them. Before he created beginnings, there were not beginnings. There was only eternality. God is eternal. God is omnipresent. That means that he is everywhere present. Everywhere there is, he is there on and on and on and on. And because he is infinite, there's no limit to his presence in both space and time. We read in the text that in the, in the beginning, the first day, where there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was morning and there was evening the first day. Well, light wasn't created till later. So that's not a discussion about light. That's a creation of time. God exists outside of time because time is a creation. And so he's everywhere all at the same time because time is a creation. He's here yesterday, he's here today, and he's here tomorrow all now. Try to wrap your mind around that. He is omnipresent in time and space. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful, and His power is unlimited. There is no limit to His power. There's no limit to what He can do. There's no limit to the power that He can express. He is omniscient. There's no limit to His knowledge. His knowledge goes on and on and on, and there's no limit to it. From time to time, as we talk about this quality, I share with you that the Internet is a vast repertoire, repository of knowledge. And for us to try to, to, to engulf all of that knowledge and to, to even view a part of it would take us forever. It would take us the rest of our lives and, and, and then some to go through all of the information that's on the Internet. Yet there is a finiteness to the Internet. There's a, there's a finiteness to the information on there. But God's, God's knowledge is unlimited. He is omniscient. <coughs> he is self-existent. He has no source. There's no source for Him. He does not stem from anything. He is self-existent. But He's also self-sufficient. He needs nothing. He doesn't need you and I to exist. He does not need you and I for anything. You and I are created beings, yes. And we are created to worship God. And you and I were made for worship. Amen. But he needs nothing. He needs no one. God is incomprehensible. And you know, we try to wrap our mind around God, and that's just kind of how we're wired. It just is. We want to try to understand everything. We want to try to reason through everything. And that's where we get in trouble when we start talking about our, our intellect and our experiences and our traditions and so forth because we try to comprehend the incomprehensible God. He's beyond us. He's so far beyond us it is incomprehensible to even understand how far beyond us He is. He is perfect. He is the absolute reference standard of perfection. And the beautiful thing is, friends, He has perfected you and I as believers by dwelling us. And when He looks at you, all He sees is Himself. God is perfect. We talked about these. He is immutable. That word immutable means that He does not alter. He does not change. And the reason He doesn't change is because all of His qualities are infinite. He is sovereign. You know, we... We oftentimes we struggle with the sovereignty of God because we think that that conflicts with your and my ability to make choices and make decisions. But friends, make no mistake, again, because of the incomprehensible nature of God, God has created you and I as sentient beings, beings that can make choices and make decisions. We're not making fake choices and fake decisions. These are our real decisions that we're making based on our genetic makeup, and the experiences that we've encountered, which were orchestrated by the Lord. They were orchestrated by the Lord. The way that I try to explain this, you know, when we talk about the sovereignty of God, people get indignant about that and say, well, you know, Calvinism. And, and they start throwing all these words that really have connotations <coughs> that, that don't really factor into what the Bible says about God's sovereignty. But when we talk about the sovereignty of God and, and the free will of man, let's look at it this way. Picture, if you will, maybe you've been to a, an illusionist, a, sh a show where there's an illusionist, and the illusionist calls a volunteer up, and the illusionist says, pick a card. 
any card, and the, the person picks a card, and they look at their card, and they go, okay, you know your card? Okay, good. You put it back in the deck, all right? And he makes four, four stacks. He says, pick a deck. Pick a stack. You pick a stack. He takes it away. You pick another stack. He takes the other two stacks away. And then he opens up. Now, ultimately, he says, is this your card? And the person always <coughs> says yes, because they're very good at what they do. But you see, friends, the person, the volunteer, made all their own choices. They made all their own decisions. He didn't control what, what card they picked. He didn't control, control which stack they picked. But he did control the outcome. The sovereignty of God, friends, is rock solid. God has a plan. He is a God of order. And his plan will prevail. But the beautiful thing is that you and I as believers, we get to be interactive in that plan. We are, we are players in that plan. God is unique. There is, no, there is none like him. We read about that in Psalms. We read about it in Exodus and 1 Kings and Isaiah and 1 Timothy. Let's talk about the goodness of God. God possesses attributes that others may possess and that we should strive after. Did you know that? That there are transferable qualities of God that you and I can exude, that you and I can express. But none but God possess all of them in a perfect, unlimited degree. He is perfectly infinite in all of these. God is holy. God is holy. He is absolutely separate from any and all sin. And you and I have been made holy. God is truth. And all true truth stems from God. If there's anything that's true, it stems from God and the truthfulness of God. God is faithful. To be faithful, friends, if you look it up in Webster's, if you, if you go to dictionary.com, you'll read that faithful is to always do what you say you will do. God is faithful. It's a transferable quality of God. He is just and he is righteous. We read about that in Nehemiah 9, in Exodus 9, in Psalm 67, in Revelation 16. God is good. And God, in and of himself, is the embodiment of goodness. Perhaps you have heard someone say, in a limited capacity, in a limited understanding of God, the perception of God, how could a good God do X or what happened. Let's remember, friends, that God is the reference standard of perfection and God is the reference standard of goodness. And for us to look at the, the God of the universe and to question like that re reflects a, a lack of understanding of who God is and a lack of understanding of the big picture. Let us never be myopic about the circumstances of life because everything that happens is necessary to bring about the greater good, to bring about God's master plan. You know, we read over in 1 Thessalonians about there's a restrainer, and the restrainer will be removed. Well, let's think about this. If there's a restrainer, why is there a restrainer? Because they're restraining. What are they restraining? They're restraining evil. They will be removed so that more evil can prevail during the tribulation. But the restrainer is limiting evil, which means that whatever occurs is necessary for God's plan to come about. But only as much evil that is necessary is allowed because there's a restraint holding back more evil. God is merciful. He directs His mercy to those who are in distress or needy. He chooses to withhold judgment that we deserve. There are lots and lots of judgments that you and I deserve for what we've done. But he's withholding those because he's a God of mercy. He's gracious. To be gracious is to extend unmerited favor. It's something that you didn't earn, something that you don't deserve, something that's given to you freely. God is gracious. He is love. He's the embodiment of love. But perhaps, friends, as, as, as Christians in 21st century America, our definition of love is, is out of a perception of godly love, of, of, of agape love. And we read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. The definition of love is this picture of selflessness. It's a picture of, 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 of <coughs> mercy and grace, yes, but it exists in a, in a perfect balance of, of infinite with God. God is gracious, He's love, He's patient. God will endure the pain for long periods of time because He loves us. He's patient. Well, what's our takeaway? 
how do we respond to God? How do we respond to our understanding of God? And how, we, how do we respond when, when our perception of God is out of alignment with what, what the truth of the Bible says? How do we respond to that? Well, how did Israel respond to God? Let's think about Israel for a second. Israel, of course, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob moves his, his family over to, over to Egypt in the land of Goshen. Uh, because because of, the, of the famine, you know, Joseph puts them up there and they, they stay there for 400 years and they become slaves. And they're exposed to Egypt and all of their polytheistic culture there, right? For 400 years. People that, that died, that, that came, came with Jacob and the, and the 12 tribes of Israel, they all died. Their descendants, their descendants, their descendants, three, four generations grew up in Egypt, exposed to this polytheistic culture, okay? So now, all of a sudden, God comes in and lays waste to all of their gods. He destroys every one of them. He, he, he demonstrates, I'm over this one, this one, this one. These are all false gods, right on up to Pharaoh himself. So 50 days later, there they are in the wilderness. Moses has to go up on the mountain to get some rules and guidelines. And while he's up there... They say, hey, well, you know, we're just going to sit down and twiddle on our thumbs. No, we need to worship. We need to, we need to worship this God who delivered us. Aaron, here, here's some gold. Make a golden calf. <laughs> and people look at that and they say, oh, they just they, they drifted into idolatry. But I want us to listen to the text here. Listen to, listen to what this, this says in the text. So Aaron told them, take off the rings of gold. This is Exodus 32 that are in the ears of your wives, sons, and daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and they received the gold from their hand, fashioned it with a graving tool, and made a golden calf. And they said, listen, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Whoa. They never stopped worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He just had a false perception of who he was. In fact, they thought there were a whole bunch of them. They had that polytheistic perception from their culture, and it was so deeply ingrained with them that when it came time to worship, they worshiped the way they knew instead of the way that God wanted them to worship. <coughs> Perhaps that changes our perception of Israel as we look at the circumstances of 21st century America and the influence of the culture. <coughs> the picture of God that may be painted by the culture. Picture of God that may be painted by our intellect, by our experiences, by our traditions. But do they align with the word? Do they align with the word? That's, that's the question at hand. So here's my challenge. During our daily quiet time, our 15 minutes a day, where we're reading the Bible, as we're studying the Bible, as we're meditating on the Bible, as we're praying to God, as we're lifting up not just prayers of intercession for others, but prayers of worship and glorifying God and confessing our sin, I want to challenge you to consider this question. Which of the following best describes the response prompted in you by studying these attributes of God? Is it praise and worship? Is it trust and confidence? Is it thanksgiving and gratitude? Is it a desire to know him more? Or is it something else? As I mentioned, I put the outline on the back table. These questions are on it. You can have those. Just go home this week. Meditate on your perception of God. Meditate on what God has for you. To show him. Show you who he is. Let's pray.